Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Plates and Pancakes. We're sitting down today with Joseph Johnson. Coach Johnson is a performance coach and the owner of Ultimate Athletic Concepts. Johnson began working with Dr. Yesis in 1994 as his protege, and then he formed the Ultimate Athletic Concepts in 2003. He began publishing books in 2005. Johnson has worked with top Soviet experts in the world of sport and human performance. He has also worked with athletes from youth to pro level. He consults with and mentors strength coaches in the private and scholastic sectors and has been a major player in the spread and implementation of the 1x20 strength training system invented by Dr. Yesis. Coach Johnson oversees the physical education program for the Reefs Puffer School District in Michigan. So welcome to the show, Coach. Hey, thank you very much for having me, and your memory is better than mine. I think that was all correct, the best of my, um, the best of my recollection. <laughs> the internet is great, and you can get a ton of stuff, but sometimes yeah. it doesn't get kept up to date, and you can be a little off yeah. on some of that. Yeah, well, I'm not running from the FBI, so it's, it's cool that it could be out there. <laughs> I listened to a couple other of your podcasts, so I know that you're giving up some cartoon time to come on the show, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, I just, my youngest son just turned 18 yesterday. He's that, you know, so he's an adult now. So I can't use, I'm going to try, but you're not supposed to be able to use them yet for all the childish indulgences. You know, I, we got to, you know, you got to have ice cream pretty regularly. You know, if you got little kids, to, you know, watch shows you're not, should be watching in terms of cartoons or kids shows or whatever. So now I, I either, one of my, my oldest son needs to, either needs to start having kids so I have a grandkid. Or uh, or the eighteen year old sticks around a little bit longer. I prayed for boys, so I had somebody to cut the grass, and it worked out okay. And when the trash don't get taken out, you got somebody to blame. I absolutely, I do have somebody to blame, and I do. Looking over some of your stuff over the years, becoming Doctor Yesis's apprentice, mm-hmm. how does that shake out? Because I'm sure he had a line of people wanting to come in and work with him. You were able to get there. You were able to do it. What did that entail? So it really, I didn't, it didn't start. I didn't think that that's what was going on in the beginning. So I went to Indiana university. I went to one of the satellite campuses in the state. Uh, I played basketball in high school. Uh, wasn't very good, especially as an athlete. Uh, and I was just intrigued. I, 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 I'm an optimist. So I, think that there's a way to do everything, right? I just haven't figured it out. And so I would start to read a lot and pretty much anything anybody told me was, hey, look, if you're not born with it, that's it, you know? And I just kind of refused to believe that. I'm defiant in that way. That just kind of spurred me more. So uh, Todd Marinovich is uh, about six months older than me. So when I was in high school, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, first high school athlete to be on the cover. Uh, and they called him Robo QB. So I saw the show. I think it was on CNN, one of them. Uh, and they talked about his training and how he had gotten up to this level and that he wasn't born that way, right? Uh, so that really kind of perked my ears up. But this is pre-internet, so I didn't, there's nothing else to follow up on, right? I didn't know who the guy that was training him, nothing like that. About five years later, uh, so into the early 90s, probably about 93, yeah, 93, I'd read a book of, uh, that Dr. Yesis had written, I didn't know who it was, Secrets of Soviet Sports Fitness and Training. Uh, and then I noticed on the back cover, there's a picture of Todd and him together. I'm like, oh, that's the same guy. So reading the book, all I wanted to know was about plyometrics because I heard that would make me jump higher and be better at it. Uh, so uh, after reading the book, uh, I called to uh, Cal Fullerton to try to get a hold of him to see if I could learn from him or if he could help me with my own training. Uh, he wasn't there. He'd already retired. Uh, so I tracked him down in Escondido at his house. And uh, we met two months later, three months later. Uh, I was flying out to California to meet him for the first time. Uh, and as I said, the rest is history. It, it's our, our initial relationship was me as an athlete for probably, I would say, three years, maybe two to three years. Uh, but I was already married at the time. I had a kid. I had a herniated disc in my back. And I also had what they call chronic fatigue syndrome. So tolerating the training was pretty, pretty difficult. So the odds were exponentially not in my favor. Um, so anyway, it, uh, then people would ask me questions about training and it just kind of evolved from there. So about 
one or two years later, I had a friend um, and his son who's, I'm kind of in between their ages. So uh, I was a friend with a guy. His son was about eight, nine years younger than me. Uh, and he was playing D1 basketball. And so we were going to tr- do this kind of like this dry run to see what could be done, right? He had graduated from Bradley University. Um, and uh, we started working on him together. This was about late 90s. And uh, they he, he went to a, 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 it would be called G League now, but it was a CBA back then, Continental Basketball Association. And that was like the minor leagues for the NBA. Guys got called up from there. <laughs> When he graduated from college, he went there. He got cut because he was too slow. We trained with him for six months. In the next offseason, he came back. He was faster than everyone. And then they found faster than everyone in the whole league in terms of the different tests they did. Basketball specifically, so it's hard to relate to other people. Anyway, uh, he so when he went back, when he got tested, uh, he went to a free agent camp that you have to pay to go to. So those are fundraisers, right? You're not making a team. Um, he makes a team. And it was so impressive, the, the, the change in his, in his performance was so impressive that the beat writer for the team called me about a free agent camp. And he wrote a story about it. He called me, said, Mr. Johnson, he goes, I've been covering the NBA and the CBA for over 25 years. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. What'd you do? And uh, so he wrote an article about it. The assistant coach at that time, his name was Dale Osborne, who uh, now is with the Orlando Magic. Uh, it's funny. I, him and I got to know each other a little bit and then we kind of fell out of touch. And then I called him. This is about six, seven years later. We hadn't talked in a while, maybe five years. We hadn't talked. And he goes, you know what? He goes, I'll always take your call. He said, I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. So, uh, so then it kind of like, I started getting, there was a little bit more of attention there and there was just different phases at one high school. I asked for my help. Another high school, I asked for my help. And it was real sh- more short term. It was like do a camp, give them an idea what to do. But I wasn't involved in the daily, right? Uh, and then uh, around 03, decided to go into kind of make it a business. And uh, I got an email from Yuri Barashansky, I think in 04, maybe. And he said, Would you guys want to translate a book of mine? And I'm like, I don't know anything about that. Duck yes, so I'm not interested. He didn't want to do it either. He could do it, he could translate it, but he wasn't interested in doing it. Uh, so I put it up on, uh, super training as when they had the message board on Yahoo, right. With Mel Sif, I put it up there and said, would you guys, anybody be interested if we did this book, uh, and got an overwhelming response. Yes. So I told doc, I'm like, well, hey, let's do it. You know, now mind you, the book was written in English. Actually, it wasn't written in Russian. So Dr. Yes has had to, I don't know what he did. He made chicken salad though. Anyway. And, uh, so that went really well. Uh, and I, you know, I thought it was a one, one time thing, you know, and then, uh, wasn't much longer later. I got a, uh, I got, uh, there was a contact made between Dr. Bandar Chuk and Troy Bandar Chuk and I, uh, he sent us transfer training. So we started with that one. Not too much longer after that, I got an email from Vladimir Zaziorski, one of his star pupils, Vladimir Estorin was looking for someone to publish books of his. So now here I am. I don't know, like 40 books later, you know, and it just kind of took on a life of its own, you know. So it's kind of like I've been involved in a bunch of different things. And one of the other things that I got involved with that I'm very uh, proud of is the Central Virginia Sports Performance Seminar with Jay DeMeo. He had called me, this is, you know, 12, 13, 14 years ago. Uh, yeah, it was at least 14 years ago and said, hey, if, if we were to put together a seminar, who would you invite? And I'm like, well, you know, my office would be available. And so they came, uh, I think that year it was Dr. Yesis and Vladimir Surin, or maybe Anatole, I can't remember now. I think it was a Surin. And so we grew a relationship there. Uh, and just, and it's kind of, you know, that now has all evolved into what I'm doing uh, now with this stuff. You'd only known, you know, the high school system that you'd been taught. So when you yeah. got, when you got with Dr. Yesis and you started getting around these guys, you had to throw away some old myths that maybe you'd had built up in your mind. And then plus you're stepping into an eye opening experience. How much of your world changed when you started getting around these guys? So initially, uh, I didn't do anything in high school Uh, for basketball. We didn't do any training, physical training. Um, and so I didn't have a presupposition there. I did have a presupposition because I lifted weights 
uh, at a, a local gym. It's a lot of older guys, you know, and um, one older guy that kind of uh, uh, would come pick me up. We go work out together, you know, and, uh, you know, it was bodybuilding essentially. Right. And then there were some guys in there that power lifted too. I didn't know the difference between either one. And I would ask them all questions. Hey, how can I jump higher or whatever? And nobody really knew. They kind of would give you some vague answer, but nobody really knew uh, on any level, right? So uh, the biggest misconception that I had was that work performed, the difficulty level was had a, a direct correlation into results of whatever it is you wanted to see, right? So like if you worked really hard and you wanted to jump higher, Okay, just keep working harder and it'll keep going up. Well, we both know that doesn't, that doesn't work, right? So, uh, it took me a little while. It took me about a year or two to even decide, make sure, make that I was really sure that Dr. Yesis was a world class expert. That took me a while because I didn't know I didn't have anything to go on. And I'm very kind of like, I don't want to say suspicious, but I don't take anything for, you know, like at face value. I want, I want to know. So I know, right? Uh, and I was talking to other people at the same time in the U.S. And then it clicked with me. I, it was probably about a year and a half into it. It clicked with me. This guy is head and shoulders above everybody else. Because I started to know enough to know when somebody didn't know what they were doing. Now, I didn't know a ton, but I could kind of start to distinguish or delineate a little bit, right? And uh, so then it was, you know, it took a while. But then I was like, okay, it's not about the effort. And I, I, I'll, I'll tell you where I actually, where I really had wrapped my head around that was when I started, when I was done, I wasn't doing it anymore. I wasn't training. Cause I think it's really hard for you when you're doing the training to not work harder if possible. Right. Uh, and, and I really started to realize it when I was the coach, then I was, cause then I think you're much more objective, right? It's just about the result. Uh, and, the other way, you're fearful when you're the athlete, you're fearful that you're not doing enough. And so you have this impulse to do more. You know what I mean? Maybe if I did more, I would have gotten better. Then you become the coach and you watch more and more cases and see that that doesn't, that doesn't hold up. You know what I mean? In real life, uh, that kind of uh, was where I really, you know, let a lot, most of my uh, supposition to go, you know, uh, and like, look, the only thing that mattered is the, the end result. And, and, and let me clarify. It doesn't matter what happens in the weight room. Is that the thing? No, the thing is, do they play better? And, and what does that mean? Well, for soccer, it's, he's fast. He's quick. He's explosive. He has good, you know, he's in great shape. Those kinds of things. Is he strong? Yeah, he's strong. But, you know, that's not like the big objective. So a lot of times people will use weight room things as their, uh, uh, their, uh, their, their the metrics that they're using to measure and I think it's related back to the sport, right? Directly. The thing that you do, whatever it is. I have a girl golfer that I'm working with. I can't control a lot of the putting and things like that. But what I, what I do measure is what's the, the club, uh, head speed and how far does she hit the ball? Not, you know, and, and ultimately it's really how far does she hit the ball in a relatively straight line, right? Uh, so I, we, we when we talk every week, it's like, uh, how, how far did you hit the ball last week? You know, and we're always looking to see, are we growing that? If we're not growing that, then I'm wasting our time. In what you just said, I've noticed it in my life and I've had to trust the process a little bit more, but the fear of not knowing it gets us to do too much with athletes when we should be coming back. And usually it's close to a big event. All of a sudden you start freaking out. You didn't yeah. do enough and now you pile it on. Getting comfortable with understanding how that works and what an athlete needs. I mean, that's a process. So did yes, is kind of back you off or is it just something that you've slowly picked up over time? He would, t I didn't listen to be honest with you. Like I didn't listen as much as I should have in the beginning. And, and he wasn't like, you know, he's almost 40 years older than me too. Right. He's old enough to be my grandfather. And so and being brilliant, being brilliant and older than me, he didn't take, he didn't always take the time to like explain everything in depth to me. He's just like, look, that's stupid. All right, move on. And not why. Right. Uh, and so I had to kind of piece some things together on my own 
not necessarily on my own, but I had to start to think about it, come back to him, think a little bit more, come back to him, uh, you know, and ask those questions. I think what it was, was what you realize is, is that, um, your the body's at, when you learn that the body's adapting to the stimulus that you give it, and it has a certain amount of time that it takes. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's like a key and lock. It's like real specific. It, it's a bandwidth that you're working in to get the body to do what you want. You're trying to trick the body. And when then once I figured that out, uh, you know, and, and, and that's basically what he was saying. He goes, look, you don't need much. He would always say that you don't need much of anything. And I'm like, yeah, but what if you did more? <laughs> you know, I know you don't need as much, but what if I did three times as much uh, of whatever that thing was? Uh, and then I, I, I'll tell you, after I had, I had been working with athletes for a decade or not. Well, I'd been with Doc for a decade. I hadn't been working with him. And uh, I, I remember saying, you know what? Let's see if I cut this back further with the kids. And they got better. I'm going to cut it back a little further yet. Let's see what happens. And they got better. I'm like, you can't, you got to be kidding me. So I learned then at that point, bare bones, you know, like give them exactly what is necessary uh and if it's not necessary don't do it and uh, so now that's oversimplistic because everybody says okay you didn't do too much too much of what well then that's a whole another question what are we what are you doing and how do you sequence it you know there's a lot of questions there too but point being is that volume in and, in and of itself ruins everything so there's no plan there could be the most perfectly laid out plan in the world and if you give it too much volume, it's ruined. It's kind of like if you're baking a cake, right? And it calls for a pinch of salt. And then you put a handful of salt. Now it sucks. Like it's, it, it goes from being the best recipe in the world to being inedible just because of too much of one of the ingredients, right? And I think training is almost very, is very analogous to that. You can give it way too much of something and now the whole thing sucks. Now, don't, now not only is the athlete not better, He's worse. And even further, now he got injured too. You know, that's always the other thing. Like if you have shin splints, you're doing too much. You have hamstring pulls regularly, you're doing too much. Or you're going zero to 100 too fast, one or the other. But the bottom line is those are overwork syndromes. They're not real injuries in terms of, you, you know what I mean, like a, like a contact thing. Understanding how to work with brilliance. You brought that up in there and then it, it took me back to some different guys I've known that see something at a level that most humans will never see something at. So their brain is looking, they're not looking at the same picture you are. Now you right. have to figure out how to look at the picture they're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. How much effort did that take on your part? I don't even know if I'm looking at it. I, I'm not looking at that on their level. I tell you that. Um, here's what I, here's what I say about that for the most part. Cause people say, Oh, you're an expert in this field. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not an expert. I've been around all the experts. The only thing is, is I know way more than you do. So it makes it look like way up here just because it's more than you. But there's levels to this and I'm nowhere near being an expert. I've just been able to be around all the experts. I, I just had this unique ability, not ability, but a unique situation where I'm at, because of the publishing business, I'm in the center of all these experts. Like, Wow. So if there's a question about something, I can call, right? Uh, I tell you what the light bulb was going on for what you're asking. When did I start to kind of see things better? You know, it's been gradual. I, I think I see things a little bit differently than I did two years ago and four years ago. Uh, the more that I see the results and then the more I talk to one of the experts about it, I'm like, oh, okay. Like now the things are more nuanced, right? It's not like I'm not learning a brand new concept. Now it's more nuanced, right? You're like, what if you did this a little bit differently, you know, in this way or that way, or use the technique a little bit differently. And I don't want to sound too foo-foo where it's like, I get all creative. It's not that. It's like, I just understand something. What will happen is it might be something that Doc said 10 years ago and the light bulb just went on. It's what he meant. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's like with your parents. 
you know, you know something your dad told you when you were 10 and then you're 30 and you're like, oh, that's cool. Took me 20 years. You know what I mean? It's the same idea. Like I'll be in a situation. I've been in a situation. I'm like, that's what he was talking about. So that's when you're talking to somebody who's really brilliant. They, they, they don't think like I do. Uh, they're way up above, you know, my level in that regard. And this is all so simple to them. And so when they say something to them, it's like, yeah, I said it. Okay. You don't understand it. You know, that's your problem. Um, so what I learned was like different things will happen where um, it, the light bulb will go on. And Dr. has told me this too. He said when he first started reading and, and researching what the Russians were doing back then, he said it took two years for the light bulb to go on for him. And he had a PhD in the field and he spoke Russian. So he said it was about the two year mark. He said, now I get what they're doing. You know, this general, the, the, the general idea of what they're doing. Uh, and for me, the light bulb has been going on. And, and you know, I talked to Anatoly Bandarchuk, you know, I talked to him fairly regularly and he said his mind's changed every couple of years or so. And he's 82. So, you know, you kind of see things differently. You hit on a bunch of different points in there that, that I'd really like to elaborate on and we'll just see how it goes. Sure. Uh, I heard Tom Dorrance say, and, and I believe it's in his book. Now, Tom worked with horses, and I talk horses a lot on here because that's a lot of my background. But sure, you learn what you need first. You typically learn it last. And if somehow you could reverse that process, everything would simplify. But you're just not oh, yeah. ready. You're not ready for the simplicity. Right. That, that's exactly right. You're not ready. It's. I always tell people that the way that Doc, uh, what he did had an elegant simplicity to it. And the, you know, what was behind it is elegant, elegant, intri intricate, detailed, uh, and complex. But what you got from it, simplicity. You know what I mean? Like when people talk about something that like, because uh, people would read, read his books and they're like, oh, that's just too simple. That's kind of the point. That was the point. And like Einstein said, uh, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it either. And that's exactly the way Doc was. He had a, an ability to take complex ideas and explain them to an average layperson, and, and, and you know, and then get the result. The other point you brought up in there, and I think I've experienced quite a bit in my life. You have to get away and go try this stuff on your own, where they can't see you, they can't see your mistakes. Yeah, you, you just work it through your head, and that's going to take some late nights, and that's going to take reading and videoing and all of these things but then like you said that one day comes where it's like ah that's what he was talking about yeah. the the importance of putting yourself not necessarily in isolation but somewhat isolation to work mm -hmm. through the ideas you just learned because information overload does occur oh absolutely i think that uh, the, what i see a lot of people like they've read every book right and then they're paralyzed by that you know, of getting, you know, really kind of figuring out what's going on. And I, I got to say this too, that, and I said this in another podcast, but, you know, reading someone's book and then seeing what they actually do in real life, two different things, two different things. Um, it, it's totally different. So they write a book because it's conceptual, right? But what we're actually going to do tomorrow morning is very practical, right? And so that's, those are two different things there. So you, I think that you need a mentor who can take you through the process. And that's what I got with Dr. Yes. We worked with athletes together. You know, we walked through the process together and he's like, okay, here's step one. How, what happened? He'll get the information from me. Okay. Here's step two. And then I'd ask him questions. Why are we doing this? Why that transition? You know, whatever the case was. Uh, and, and I started to learn his reasoning instead of just conceptual stuff. That makes sense. They understood so much stuff different. Like I got to talk to it's von Javork the other day and he came to Texas A&M in the early eighties. And I can only imagine what going to Texas A&M as, you know, a communist nation or living in a communist nation, what that was like, you know, right, right. but, but he was talking about the restoration means that they understood we're just now starting to get to with 
saunas and cold tanks. Yeah, yeah. We, we utilized them a little bit, but they weren't out there for the general public. Now pull on Instagram yeah. now and there's, you know, it's at your fingertips. Yeah, why, sure. Why did that take so long? Why did the translation, was it the Cold War? What did that? I think it's probably it's two things, I think. And by the way, let me tell you something. This is interesting about the, the especially the sauna. So I believe that the sauna helped recovery for the longest time. Uh, and, uh, and then I also learned that, that Yuri Bereshansky didn't believe in any recovery methods except for he did use the sauna. But here's what's interesting. The sauna actually isn't a recovery method. It's like an adaptogen. It hardens the body to stress because it's, you're being stressed, right? So then the body starts hardening to that stress. So you become, uh, you know, less vulnerable. You'll become more resilient to work. I thought it helped expedite the recovery process itself that's not actually what happened and uh so i thought that was kind of an injury i i didn't know that for a long time and so it's, a, it's more of an adaptogen really uh and, and yuri didn't believe in recovery processes for the most part in training in training because if you tried to get the body to recover faster then the adaptations would be blunted you wouldn't get the adaptation that you were looking for because now you stop the process of how the body adjusts to the stimulus Makes sense when you think about it that way, but you know, when you don't know, you think about it the other way. Well, let's just recover faster, then we can do it again, right? It's not actually how it works. So, uh, you know, I, I, but to go back to the original question, the language barrier is number one. There was only a handful, less than a handful of people in the United States who could translate those uh, works into English, uh, who had the scientific and the language background. I think I, I want to say Jess Jarver was one of the other ones, uh, along with Dr. Yes. Dr. Yes by far did the most voluminous, you know, work in that area. He did the journal for not 29 years. Uh, and then the, the other part, because it was available to the United States, the other part was cultural. Uh, you know, we believed uh, that everything was, you know, bodybuilding kind of like mentality or powerlifting mentality. And so we didn't really understand there was this big distinguishing thing for uh, developing an athlete. So the recovery stuff, uh, yeah, I, it's just now, like you said, some of these uh, interventions are just now coming in vogue, uh, especially sauna. It's gotten a lot more popular, cold plunging, all that stuff. Um, I, I'm not a hundred percent. I think that, I think that a lot of that stuff got into English, you know, cause you had the, like in Finland, you know, the, the sauna is big there. Uh, and I, I hear a lot of people quoting studies from there. Uh, that's my guess. That's my guess. You know, uh, we're still behind like, like adaptogenic substances. We still don't use them very much here in the United States. Uh, they're still kind of under the radar I, from what I can tell. Anyway. You know, and the other, other problem is, is because things are commercial here, things get overstated or stated incorrectly because there's this commercial motivation. Uh, whereas in the Soviet Union, there was only one motivation, which was to be more effective. And if you weren't effective, you know, you were disregarded. So there you, you kind of had to bring it. You had to have the, you had to have the real thing where over here, uh, you know, you could start a company based off someone's work that you've never met. And, and that work may be incomplete or whatever. You know, you can make any study look like you wanted to, uh, just look at pharmaceutical ads. Um, you know, you can make anything look the way you wanted to, right? And so I think that's the, the commercial aspect is probably the third part that those three things make it much more difficult to have that translation into our culture. And talking to Javoric, it, it was just unbelievable. It's like, you know, when he, when he got over here, he was shocked we weren't doing it, but then he got to throw out all these ideas and, and, and see it pay off in a new country. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And then, you know, and, and even then, like, you know, it's grown here in the United States, but I would say it's still not uh, at the average. You know, it's not like super common. It's becoming more common, but it's still on that uptick. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like every day everyone knows. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I would say the people that I know in my local radius it, that are involved in sports don't know anything about either one of them very well. And how they rotated them. You know, oh we, yeah, exactly. We, we do one or the other, it seems like, but they would go from hot to cold to hot to cold. Yeah. Yeah. That's when, yeah. So, okay. So if you're using like the contrast method, which is really good for bringing the nervous system back, 
yeah, there's a lot of different strategies with that, you know, hot shower, cold tub, hot tub, go jump out in the snow if you live somewhere really cold. What's the ratio? Three to one, how often should you use it? Because the body also gets adapted to the recovery method and then it doesn't work as well. And so you do, you have to rotate them. That's exactly right. We're off down a little bit of a rabbit hole here. So there was a question that I had for you and I heard you talk about it and it made so sure. much sense. So we'll just stay down this rabbit hole just a little bit longer. Yeah, go ahead. But as far as sports goes, PEDs are always going to be a part of it. It, it just sure. is. Sure. But their understanding and how they used them over there was so much different than how we did. And in the podcast you were talking about yeah. that Bonderchuk knew if he took performance enhancing drugs, he was going to get three meters on his hand yeah. throw. There, right. was, there was no reason to take those drugs until you were in striking distance. Where, right. where here, it seems like guys are, they have that pushed on them to take them no matter what. You know, yeah. Uh, no matter how far they're out from elite or whatever the case may be, it's it, the more is better mentality. Maybe here, yeah, exactly. Well, I think it's once again it it that comes back to bodybuilding, body because you know bodybuilders were known for taking bigger doses of, of uh, you know they were the ones who probably experimented first with the, the drugs, right? And like anything else, you know, more is better, right? Is kind of the mentality there. Uh, the differences are this. Number one, we introduced the Soviets to, to, to performance enhancing drugs. It wasn't the other way around. Uh, we, we kind of started moving with it. They picked up on it. Uh, but what they did that was different than us is they took the smartest people in, 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 in the medical sciences and in physiology, started figuring out what, number one, what do the drugs do? Number two, uh, how do you use them in training? Where do they make sense? And most importantly, I can't overemphasize this enough, the dosage. We do just insane stuff dosage-wise. And I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. So I've never been around it up close. I don't know any. I mean, I knew some guys probably that did bodybuilding, but not in sports. I don't know of anybody that does it. Uh, and the, the, what I've had articulate to me, and, and this was from Dr. Michael Kalinsky. He was uh, at the top of the food chain in Kiev uh, back back then. And he was one of the people uh, helping to oversee the doping program. Matter of fact, he did a lecture at, um, he's at SUNY now in upstate New York, but he did a lecture at uh, the CBAS uh, conference about 10 years ago. And he actually brought the documents that showed it was a state-sponsored program. He actually had the literal you know, documents. It was really interesting. But, but what they did was they, they learned how to use them. To, to the good effect. And one, th and one thing they had made mistakes early on, maybe 60s and 70s, where the dosages were way too high and they were finding out guys weren't getting up to their high level. You know what I mean? They were getting hurt too easily because, as a result of overuse of the, of the drugs. And the East Germans were probably the biggest example of that, you know, overdoing it. Uh, over here, what we, for us, it's a cultural thing. It's kind of like the same with the training. If a little testosterone is good, I know a ton of testosterone is good, but you know, when you realize that your body only has so many receptors for it and the rest of it now is toxicity to you, it's not doing anything positive, only negative, uh, then you would, <laughs> you know what I mean? That it makes, it's a clear, clear picture for you, I guess. So yeah, I, the PED thing, it's way overblown. The Russians did it, but they did it. Uh, no, more. I don't even think that I wouldn't even say they did it more than us. They just did it better than us, and they, they were more organized, and they were more knowledgeable about it, um, and uh, and they found out the pitfalls of it. And, and like like Dr. Bundachuk said, it's three meters. So we still got to train to get up to that level. And I remember him telling me he had two kids that were coming up to train. They were at, like, you know, college age, and they wanted to take creatine. He goes, what do you want to take creatine for already? We're still, you know, we're still getting better. So to him, it was like, creatine? He was objecting to that. He wouldn't even talk about steroids yet. Just the creatine he thought was too early at that age. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Speaking of the pitfalls, the the drug use, is that what led them down such a connective tissue, uh, you know, fascia building raw idea, I guess, was they started seeing that the recovery, uh, the muscles got really big really fast, but the connective tissue could not keep up. Yeah. 
I think that's where they I think that's where they kind of put the brakes on on its use. And then they also realized this was kind of like parallel. What they found out was just being stronger wasn't better either. You know what I mean? Didn't always equate to better. So like with Anatoly Transfer Training, he wrote that book for that reason. And that was, I think he originally wrote it in 1985, somewhere there, late 80s. And the idea was how much squatting strength is enough for a shot putter. Like if he gets a, like, so he, he told me, he said there was a shot putter in the 60s they had. He could, he could uh, bench press. And this was his, one of his contemporaries because he was still competing and until he was still competing. He said, guy could bench press 700 pounds, but he couldn't throw very far. So then they, the, the, the idea started to come in. Okay. This is, this is not like a proportional direct relationship, right? It is up to a point getting stronger is, is, it, you know, relates to a better result, um, ultimately. But then you get to a certain level and now it's a, uh, but you know, it doesn't relate at all. And then it becomes a negative relationship. So yeah, I, I think that's kind of, you know, it, the kind of parallel. It's like, okay, up to this level. Okay. Now you got to come up with a different idea. So that's, does that make sense? And that, then you start getting into, yes, this is ideas possibly. And Marv Marinovich is sure. training explosively that if you're not training explosively, it, it's not going to carry over to the field like you want it to. Sure. Sure. So no, let, let me give that context. Marv brought Todd to Dr. Yeses when Todd was like 13. He had been a strength and conditioning coach for the Raiders previously, but he really didn't understand the concepts very well. And so uh, you could see this like in the last 10 years or so of his life. I think he's been gone a couple of years now. And I don't want to speak ill of anybody at all. That's not the point. I just don't think he understood conceptually what was going on. He understood like, the big ideas in some ways, but then they got misapplied, you know, and, and, and weren't as effective in my opinion. Cause I looked at some of the stuff that he did and I'm like, where did he get that from? It doesn't even resemble what Todd did, you know, to get, to get up to the level that he got up to. I think here's the thing. And, and you, you're, you're like opening a Pandora's box because there's so many, so many ways to answer this question. So I'm going to do my best. One of the way, things is, how was the strength developed? Was it developed by using 90% and above one rep max stuff? Was it one by 20? Uh, was it a combination? Those things will have a relationship back on to how explosive the athlete gets that in itself. Because if you're using that really like 95% stuff, the weight is moving really slow, right? So now you're not, you're, the nervous system is, is developing a slow, slow pattern. Right now, that aside, the way that the, the other one is developed is by uh, slowly getting stronger, especially as that is younger. And then we're implementing in some, some explosive work to like a jump progression, kind of a la Verashansky, you know, a jump progression where you're going with, you know, uh, extensive long coupling jumps and slowly on the spectrum, taking your way over to intensive short coupling stuff so one end of the spectrum would be something that's you know pretty light and easy and springy and the other end of the spectrum would be a deck jump they're, they're kind of like the polar ends of that that scale so you could do strength training and and, and and get more explosive for a while and then it starts to level off and it does it pretty quick it'll do it in high school kids uh, and it does do it in high school kids all the time because all they're doing is lifting really power lifting heavy and no no jumps no nothing else and, and that caps pretty quickly. You know what I mean? It doesn't take long because the nervous system of, of, of a teenager is not, um, is not, uh, what you, what you'd say. It's not, uh, malleable enough. You, or, or, I'm sorry. It's too malleable. It's very plastic. And so it, it, it doesn't need that kind of stimulation. And so it takes hard for the body to recover from. It's hard for, uh, for the progress to be made, the body starts using more emergency type of uh, adaptation responses uh, to um, to the stimulus, right? Kind of puts the brakes on as fast as it can in that regard. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of like I'm a little all over the place there, but does that make sense? Yeah, and what you mentioned in there earlier, I kind of had a question on 
So sure. they had a system and they worked from general to very, very, very specific. Sure. And with what you said in there, do you work in, in starting in general and you work until that at, adaptation quits being seen on the field and then you're already starting to backfill the next adaptation like you don't go straight to specific if general is going to make your athletes better right is right that, is so, that what they were looking at so anytime the russians developed the concept it was because what they had been using wasn't working anymore so when they went from general to specific back in the 70s they were probably 80 20 general to specific work and then that kind of started to flip flop in the eighties. What they, what they, and, and this was like, like with, uh, the classical periodization and block periodization model, they started to change because they were seeing that they were bumping their heads against, like they weren't getting any better, right? They were bumping their heads on the ceiling. And so they said, okay, this guy is super strong in these general exercises, but he's not getting better in his event, whatever it was, right? So that's where the idea of dynamic correspondence started to come in play, and they started to use more specific exercises. I would say it was a progression, and I, I, I would say that it was an incomplete progression at the time that the Soviet Union fell apart. So they were using some specific exercises, but I would say Dr. Yesis took that further. After the Soviet Union fell apart, he started to develop more and more specific exercises um, that they had not yet experimented with. So... Yeah, it was kind of on, like, I, I would say the, the 60s and the 70s were kind of the peak of where it was just like general strength. And they knew that this worked, right? They just didn't know how far it worked because they hadn't gotten to the point where it didn't work anymore. When they got there to that point, they're like, okay, now what do we do? And then that's where, this, that's where the, uh, the specific work started to come in. How specific can you get before, you know, I've heard this said, like, uh, with throwers. You got to be careful how close you get to their throw because you'll mess up their throw. So how specific can you get to the competitive exercise before you see an effect that you don't want? Or does, is it even possible? Well, you got to understand the parameters around what's, what, it, what do we mean by specific? Exactly. Right. So someone could say, if you're a thrower, okay, we're going to throw, uh, you know, a, a hammer, let's say, for example. And we're going to throw a 50 kilogram when it's heavy. And we're going to develop that part. <laughs> the rule is this, is that if you use heavier and lighter, which is something that Anatoly really was the one that really developed highly. Um, what, uh, what he did was the, the rule, the rule was if you, if you use something like that's slightly heavier, slightly lighter, you can't change the technique too much. It has to be real close, right? So he would use like, a, I think it was like a nine something kilogram hammer. And I think seven something kilograms is the, is the normal one. I can't remember now. Or a lighter one. But they have to be not that far off so that they don't change technique, right? So specifics, you can get very specific. I think the most specific thing that you could do is like wearing weighted clothing, like weighted shorts with the right amount of weight placed at the right place, used at the right time. There's, there's rules, right? It's not just some helter skelter kind of approach so you would be let's say for example if you're uh, uh you play basketball you might go play one game with the shorts on around uh, up closer to the hips and then you might use the lower limb uh, weights that are around the shin uh you go out and play one game then you take them off and then you play another game what you're seeing then is the the muscles got all tuned up for the first one because they have to they have to, to contract much harder right and then um, uh, I'm trying to think like, and, and then when you come back, the muscles think you still have the shorts on. So now they're real explosive. And so it, using that over and over again, now you're starting to get more fibers and fall in that explosive way. You kind of, once again, tricking them. Also, the other way that you could see is like uh, using a sled uh, for sprinting. And the way that that would be done would be, you want to put the sled where, uh, with a weight that only changes the speed by 10% or less. So now it has carryover. If it's more than 10%, now it's, uh, now it's changed everything. The technique has changed. That's the biggest thing is the carryover in technique. You know what I mean? So once you have that, uh, you're satisfying that main 
uh, objective, that's, that's the idea behind specific. So when you hear people say, I don't believe in sports specific or I believe in sports specific, I don't think neither one of them know what they're talking about. Does that make sense? Like they don't know what does sports specific mean? It's not sports specific. It's skill specific. Is it duplicating the thing that you're going to do when you're on the field? You know what I mean? So uh, that is a, an entirely different thing. And I don't think I haven't seen hardly anybody in the United States execute that very well. Not to my knowledge. Yes, it's it's almost an elusive idea at times. It's, yeah, it's be yeah, it's beyond elusive. Like I don't even think they know what the concept is. Like every now and then, you don't hear you hear some people saying they don't know what the answer is. I don't think people know what the question is, and that is the bigger problem. They don't even know what we're asked, what they're asking. They don't know what to ask. If that makes any sense, because their concept of what is sports specific is not. You know what I mean? It's not sport specific because that's really a bad term. It's there's a there's a skill involved that you're executing, and you got to know can you execute that skill? Does that make sense? It's actually a pretty profound answer, to be honest. You know what I mean? If 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 you don't know what question you need to ask, you, no answer will ever satisfy that. And this is the problem when you're dealing with really brilliant people. What I was talking about earlier, I didn't know what questions that. My questions got better as time went by. Then my understanding got better. But I have to understand what questions to ask first. I don't even know what to do. I didn't even know how to do that. And so in this case of sports specific, nobody's asking the right question. What is it? What are we trying to do exactly? And then what method do we apply or what you know, intervention do we apply that then results in this better performance, right? I don't think anybody does it. I, and I think in a corporate setting, it would be really difficult to do anyway. Individual athlete would be no problem. Right. Yes, but you get a lot of athletes, and then it changes very quickly because the needs of the athlete are all going to be different. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and here's the other thing. How, do you know how much weight should be on the short so the technique doesn't change? No, you don't know. Do you know, uh, you know what the duration should be? What should the rep ranges be? Like if you're throwing a hammer, a heavier one, and a lighter one, how, what are the reps on that? Let me give you an example. Anatoly told me that when he first got started in uh, as a coach, they would throw about 70 throws a practice. He said at the very end, you know, when he was in Canada, he got to about seven throws. So how do you know? You know, how many of the nine kilograms should we throw? How many of the six? How many of the regular one? How many of the other ones that are in between? How should we do those? That gets deep. And an American coach have enough time just trying to figure out, you know, the very fundamental issues. That one is way over their head because they don't have any research to show what that should be anyway. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Think about it. Who did who who in America did the research on that? No one. <laughs> I guess to hop into another elusive topic, eccentric loading. Yeah. Fast, slow, over eccentrics, over speed eccentrics. Yeah. yeah. Tinkering with that, how much carryover do you get to sport? I know like Louis Simmons, he was against slow eccentrics. He was yeah. somewhat against eccentric training because he didn't he felt like it caused more injury. He wanted fast eccentrics that turned to the concentric and made a sharp V. That's something I've been tinkering with, trying to understand what I need for my athletes. Yeah. What are your thoughts on eccentrics? So eccentrics, you have three different formats. You have super maximal, which are, you know, you're lowering more than 100% of the load. You have a fast eccentric, which is kind of like uh, an altitude drop. And then you have the slow eccentrics where you're bringing the weight down nice and gradual, right? Um. I, I think that at the lower level is probably where the slower eccentrics make the most sense, where you're kind of just getting used to controlling this load slowly, and that'll carry over to sport for you still. You know what I mean? And it depends on what we're talking about. So I, I'll give you an example. We use one we call a four-count delayed squat, where we'll go down and hit four positions. Now, nice and slow, hold it, nice and slow, hold it, nice and slow, hold it, and then jump out of it. And then that, what hopefully what that's doing is when you're holding that isometric, you're getting more fibers involved and they get tricked into 
being involved in the jump upwards, if that makes sense. Uh, the, the fast eccentrics or the altitude drops, you know, I think that, uh, in most sports where real sharp cutting actions are involved, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, and, and, and you got to remember the eccentric is a means to an end inside the training. It's not so much a means. I better say this correctly. It's not just like, okay, we're doing this for the carry over run to the sport. Eccentrics normally should just be a lead up uh, the proceeding to plyometric training. So that the plyometric training is better, right? Because if you can hit the ground and let that eccentric contraction be as quick as possible, then that means you can get back up quicker, right? And jump higher. So it's, it's kind of facilitating that, right? I would say on the supra maximal, the place where that would make sense would not be with a lower level athlete for sure. I don't even know about an intermediate athlete. I think what it, where it makes a lot of sense is like if you're, you have a higher level athlete who's doing, um, you know, a depth jump, let's say like 36 inches, 40 inches. And this would be the segment before like the, the cycle, the four week cycle or so, something like that before that plyometric cycle. That's where super maximal would make sense. So it, it all depends. It's contextual, right? It depends on what you're doing. I'll use a, uh, like a super maximal eccentric uh, on like uh, hip abduction with an athlete who's been training for 10 years. Uh, and basically, so that's not as exhausting to the nervous system, right? He brings the hip up, I push it back down. So that way, when we do a lateral plyometric, his, his contact with the ground will be brief for hopefully. Uh, and then I'll also use some very specific ones like uh, cutting actions in basketball. I may have them do like an eccentric side lunge where they jump back towards, like, you know, they're being held by a band, you know, and they jump back towards the base and they hit the ground harder. It's kind of like, a, it's called like an adjustable depth jump for laterally. Does that make sense? So there's different eccentrics that you can use in different ways that would apply maybe a little bit lower level, but then the bigger concepts, the general concept, I would say the, the slow eccentric would make the most sense across that you know, age range. Uh, and then the, uh, the other two, I would say the altitude drop, you would never do until the athlete is ready is doing plyometrics and has been doing them for a little while. Uh, the other one, I would say, I would reserve that, you know, until the athletes either high level or close. Cause that, that's a lot to the nervous system. That's a lot because the nervous system goes nuts when you, are lowering 130% of your one rep max. It's no joke. You know what I mean? It's not something you do every day. Now, I know you have been a big proponent of the one by 20. Sure. What makes that so effective? Are you hitting the whole strength curve? Is it the uh, conditioning it gives you? Is it everything? Yeah. I mean, did yeses kind of find this system in there that hits everything in one idea? Yeah, I, uh, so he that was part of his doctoral thesis was endurance and strength and how they kind of intersected. Um, it, it it's funny because people say you know the one by twenty system. It's not a system. It was just part of GPP. He just liked that at the beginning. And the four main things were it developed strength really fast. We liked that. It created more um, uh, capillary density in the muscle tissue and in the. Uh, ligament tendon structures, which would make you more injury proof and the capillary density in the muscles would allow for, uh, you know, better, faster recovery and also better endurance, especially if it was coupled with running that was similar. Uh, the other thing that it did really well is it helped ingrain the neurological pathways really well. So the technique would be good. And then when you're talking about using the one by 20 with specialized exercises, it's great because it would allow you to develop really good technique with exercises that are specialized. Does that make sense? And so uh, you're killing about four birds with one stone. Uh, and, and yeah, you're in better shape. We would like, we'd have somebody like run a timed mile during that phase and the mile would get faster, faster than normal. If that makes sense. So yeah, it, it, it's, it, it w the name didn't come about till 10 years. Or so. I can't remember. It's been at least 10 years ago. He's like, you know, we got to come up with a name for this. And, and I, I wasn't in agreement. He goes, we'll call it one by 20. I said, it sounds stupid to me. And then later on, he gives me credit for it. And he says it was my idea and it wasn't, it was his idea. Um, but yeah, using it, look, the results that we get in terms of strength development, nobody else gets. 
you know, I, I mean, we've got kids doing stuff that are ridiculous. Strength, like, and I don't even care, right? Uh, and the principle underlying this, the strength component was stated best by Bondar Chuk. He said the last four reps of a 20 rep set, he said, are no different than the four rep set of, you know, 85, 90%. He's just the same idea on the nervous system. So I take his word for it, I guess. Yes. In the beginning, you're really moving pretty quick. You're, you're moving probably faster than speed strength. Then, sure. you, hit, then you hit speed strength and you kind of work through that phase. And then yeah. you, at the end, you hit your strength speed and then hopefully your isometric at the last yeah. rep or so. So that's the idea I've been running with in my head that if you can hit that whole strength curve in your workout, you're going to produce a better athlete. Yeah. 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 So it was, it, it, it does so many things so well, right? It develops strength better than other patterns. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, Jeff Moyer. I don't, do you know, Jeff? No, I don't. Okay. So he, he runs uh, DC sports training in Pittsburgh. He had called me a long time ago. Hey, I want to try what you guys do with my high school team in New York. So we did, I gave him the instructions. What he didn't tell me was that he held some of the kids back and used a different strength development program, a one that's very, very popular. I uh, did them side by side. And he said like six to eight weeks in, he goes, it was apparent. These weren't even close. He goes, you were blowing away. He said the only objective of the other one was to develop strength. And the one by 20 would say four objectives was getting that done better than the other one by a factor of like almost two to one. So go figure, right? I hadn't put much stock in, in the idea of the conditioning aspect. And we just got back from a vacation and I'd been tinkering around with the door. I hadn't done any physical conditioning like you would think of. I hadn't done a lot of walking. I hadn't done a lot of running, but I'd been doing a little bit of the one by 20 ideas. And I was shocked at how well I could recover and how far I could go with not doing the traditional ideas of you need to be out walking and running to get yourself yeah. in shape. It kind of blows your mind a little bit. It's it's totally changed my idea on how to possibly uh, prepare a wrestler or something like that. Yes, they, they need some aerobic work, obviously, because it's an, somewhat of an aerobic component on the sport, but... If you can keep that mass on them and you can keep that size on them and start conditioning through the weight room, you should have a healthier, bigger, stouter wrestler when you're done. Yeah. And and more and more injury resilient too, for sure. Keeping the train training seamless. How are you able to kind of do that? In what way? You know, you're going from a general from a kid you're just getting him in. You're starting to introduce the weights. You're starting to introduce a one by twenty. Well, now yeah. that that's kind of quit carrying over. You're you're looking at a long term plan. You know, let's say he's an he's a middle school kid or she's a middle school kid. Well, now the general isn't carrying over the field like it was. So now you want to start hitting something that's a little bit more specific. And until that quits, how are you looking at a long term plan that will help? keep the training where it's always progressing but it's never over their head yeah so it's 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 what yuri would always say he said most of your training plan should always dovetail in and out should not be abrupt changes abrupt you know material uh i think that uh for me what i do is like let's say i'm starting in the 20s right and uh the first year i may only just use kind of broad general exercises with them uh and then as i get further along i might start to add a few things in so i might be i'm trying to think of what the best way to describe this i i will start it depends on how the learning curve is like if they're really younger and they don't know anything and you know we'll just only use general stuff for quite a while because it's not necessary right uh if they're a little older and I'm, I'm thinking like, so really young, when I say really young, I mean like maybe under 14 years old, 14 uh, ish, they can start to handle a little bit more. But then again, it's still contextual in the sense that if this athlete's responding really well, I'm not adding a lot. Uh, if the athlete needs something, let's say, for example, he's a baseball pitcher, then I might introduce some specific movements uh, for the, the 
rotation of the shoulder or a little bit earlier with him because I'd like to have him injury proof, right? So I'd like to get more blood uh, in, developed into the elbow and into the shoulder with some of those movements. Um, and, and so it, 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 this is where the art of coaching comes in. It's kind of a nuanced thing. I'm, I'm watching how they're performing, how they're improving. If they're just like taking off like a rocket and really improving, I'm not doing, I'm going to let it ride for a while, right? Let's see what happens. Um, and I don't wait till they're not improving either. Like, I don't wait, oh, guys, what are we going to do now? I'll just kind of say, okay, we're humming. Not too bad. It's coming along good. Okay, let's add something. Let's see what happens. So I'll add something. See what happens. Uh, wait a week or two. Add something else. Let's see. What, I do this with the jumps, too. Like, uh, specifically, like, I'll say, okay, let's try this jump. See how they do. Then I try another one. See how they do. I'm watching as I add something, this, do the parameters start to change? So, like, if I add a jump, the first one, and then I'm up to three jumps. Did that first one stop improving as fast? If it did, then I went up too fast, right? So I got to bring them back. So um, when I go from general to specific, a lot of it will be related to the training age of the athlete and their age in general. Uh, the other thing will be specific to, and I don't like, I hate saying these kinds of things that it depends, but uh, like some people respond to training differently, right? And you're trying to figure out how does this athlete, how would they respond quicker? And so you're trying to decipher that as you're going to. So that'll play into it as well, because somebody might be like, everything I do just works wonderfully. And other somebody else, it works, but not as good. You know, um, everybody gets a little bit of a different result, right? Uh, so then when it comes to the specifics, um, you know, I, I, I would be more inclined to bringing it in sooner if the athletes get like really strong in the general movements and they're doing really well. I'll start to look more in that direction because I know that this isn't going to last forever. Right. You know, them getting stronger and then a parlaying into being better. If that makes sense. So uh, I, it's a judgment call. Uh, and I would say. Oh, there's just so many variables there, but like if the athletes 20. And they're, and, and they're coming to me, or they're, let's say they're 22, they're out of college, and they're trying to make it to the next level. I may move some of those things faster. Whereas if he's 14 and he's in high school or he's in middle school, um, we'll hold off on it. And, and, and so I might be more, more abrupt with the older athlete where I'm, I'm putting more specificity in, where with the younger athlete, I'm going to really take my – if he's never been exposed to anything, I'm just going to add one, add one, and then watch what the results are. And then I, that's how I determine, you know, how far we go with that. Well, I know we've been on here a while and you got other things to do today. So I'll kind of wrap up with this question and let you have your, uh, your day to do whatever you like. Um, you mentioned it in there and it had me, th it's had me thinking for a little while and me and a mutual friend of ours has talked about this quite a bit too. Most athletes are not going to make it past high school. You're going right. to have, you're going to have your exceptional guys that, that go to college, then go to the pros, whatever the case may be. But most at the end of their senior year, they're done. Mm -hmm. I understand the slow cooking process, but at what point do you kind of got to throw, you got to throw some stuff at them mm -hmm. because their time is short. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and, and it's, and, and the answer is going to be counterintuitive. If you throw more at them, they might get worse. You know what I mean? So the qu the real question is this, and this is what I tell people when they bring their kids to me. Um, you tell me what the goal is, and then I'll tell you if I can get it in the time frame done that you need done. So you say he's fifteen. I'd like him to play college ball, right? And he runs a five six forty, and he's a running back. Yeah. It's going to be tough, right? I can't tell you that in three years, I know that I can do that. Now, I have done it. I did it in three years. I went, we went from a 5.5 five to a 4.6, I think, with a kid I recently had. But I'm trying to you know, be realistic, right? Because here's the thing that you have to understand. This kind of goes back to our original, original question. More is not better. More necessarily won't create, make them faster. It might make them worse, right? Because if I use that reasoning... Then I could say, well, let's just go to a 40 inch depth jump. Let's just get right into it. Right. But we both know that's not going to work. 
and the asset will probably get hurt. So you can't speed, you know what I mean? You can't microwave it. It's, it still takes the time that it takes and you still aren't ready for something until you're ready for it. So like it, that'd be, that'd be like saying, okay, you're in uh, third grade math, but if we give you calculus now, you'll really be ready, right? You'll be ready for, co- you can't do that. So if you have a high school guy who's doing third grade math, don't give him, calculus ain't going to help. No. Does that make sense? That makes an incredible amount of sense. And to come at it from the total opposite way, I guess really drives that point home. You can only do what the athlete's ready to do. That's what you're doing the whole time is trying to figure out, you know what I mean? What the next, what, what is the best option in this moment? Right. And if you give too intensive methods to somebody too early, it doesn't work and it ruins them for later because you can't come back to it again and it be effective. Does that make sense? You've used your magic bullet. Yes. 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 And it's over. It's, so that's why you're trying to keep as many, many uh, bullets in the chamber as you possibly can. That's like we had talked earlier about PEDs. The minute you start down that road, you can't go back and, and, no. and get that same effect. So right. everything has to be dosed when it needs it. Yeah. Otherwise, you shot your wad, right? Now it's, now you're, it's over. So right. that's why you're trying to be as conservative and hold back as many things as you can, right? Until the appropriate time. So if you have someone and he's not ready and he's 18, like, look, bro, you know, unless you want a red shirt and hold out and we'll wait a little bit. You know, I think maybe we can get to where you want to get, but I'm not going to lie to you and tell you, I think, you know, that I can get you. Like, if we do all this other stuff, it's not going to work. I'll get you hurt. That'll suck. You know what I mean? So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the, the, the crux of all that, you know, the, the caveat, I guess. Well, coach, I have a ton more questions and one of these days we'll have to do this again. Let's, and Yeah, let's do it again. Let's do it again. I, I would love to. Uh, I, there's a lot of things there you brought up that we could discuss more deeply that would give you know better understanding. So you let me know when. Let's do it again. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking time. You obviously didn't know me and really didn't know what you were walking into, and you still said yes. <laughs> so thank well, you. Well, I, I, I'm happy I did. I've enjoyed it. Well, that's that's the overall goal is uh, it, to at least enjoy your time on here. I enjoyed it. My dog didn't as much, but... <laughs> You know, that that's my thought. So anyway, thank you so much for having me and let's I'm I'm happy. Let's do it together.